Brent Porcia at topvelocity.net. This is going to be a quick review of my presentation on strength training for pitching velocity. Uh, I covered this uh, in a recent presentation at the ALA Baseball Coaches Association. First, it starts off and goes in showing a lot of the peer-reviewed evidence today that exists showing that strength training improves pitching velocity. You know, it wasn't always the case. We look at the conventional wisdom and the way it was pre-2000, a lot of coaches were saying that uh, pitching velocity is something you're born with. You definitely couldn't develop it. But post-2000, there's just so much evidence now and, and just a handful of studies here showing that uh, strength training improves pitching velocity. You know, basically any type of resistance training has an effect on it. Uh, you know, and then it even looks at, you know, even over a four-week um, cycle, it, it has an effect. Or, um, you know, also or three times a week, five, five over five weeks. So there's so many different ways they've looked at it and you really see that it's pretty strong evidence that we can improve pitching velocity through uh through resistance through strength training if um if, if that's something that we have time to do with the athlete i also went through and covered a lot of kind of the conventional wisdom that still kind of exists today and, and how we think about developing pitchers because there's still a lot of uh, things in the way that are preventing us from really evolving with the new science and the new information and one of those being flexibility it's this still this old belief that flexibility is is something separate uh that we train s separate of say strength training so if like if you're training strength training you're, you're actually you're hurting flexibility and that's not the case you know it, I, I use these two pictures it's pretty funny but you actually can develop flexibility without strength but it's ultimately going to hurt you as an athlete not help you you know but a, a lot of coaches ultimately the old school coaches would push you to into flexibility and to steer you away from strength and conditioning and, and like for example the picture of the ballerina here that's really what you're going to get you're just going to get a ballerina that um that is flexible but not that explosive powerful dynamic like the olympic lifter the olympic lifter is the perfect combination of flexibility and strength and power which is ultimately what's going to drive a better uh you know f a pitcher who throws harder a hitter who has more bat speed it's going to develop the better athlete and we can see it here there's evidence showing it you know that eccentric training improves flexibility over static stretching so meaning like you get actually more flexibility in a lift when you're moving through an eccentric part of the movement or strength training in combination with uh, resistance training is by far the better way to do it than just static stretching. Also too with body mass, it's like, you know, a lot of the old school mentality is that if we get bigger, we lose flexibility. Well, the study here shows on average, bigger bodies typically throw harder. And we know, uh, you know, you can see even with bodybuilders, there's bodybuilders look like they couldn't, you know, touch, you know, they're behind their back, put their arms behind their back and they're extremely flexible. So there's definitely, misunderstandings of how body mass affect flexibility, how strength and conditioning affect flexibility. And if done correctly through full body training, you actually like the Olympian can train it all in, into one athlete, which is really what you're trying to do. Endurance, endurance is another, you know, kind of a, a, a way or an old school misunderstanding of developing the athlete. A lot of coaches used to believe endurance was uh, all that pitchers really needed to be conditioned. Um, they just needed to endure long distance running, right? Running poles. Problem is like the study here found that those that apply more cardiovascular endurance, it's actually incompatible with neuromuscular power. So meaning those that you actually put through a lot of cardiovascular endurance training, they actually lose power. So you're gonna slow down. You're, you're gonna lose your velocity. You're gonna lose your bat speed. You're gonna lose your sprint speed. But the, the, the crazy thing about the misconception is endurance just means to endure something over time. And you can endure two different types of things. You can endure, you know, aerobically, which is with oxygen, or endure anaerobically. And anaerobically is, is really where the neuromuscular power is at its, at its highest. And that's like the short sprint work. So, like, I could, I could instruct a bunch of athletes to go out and do sprints for an hour. And I could also tell them just to go out and run around the block for an hour. Ideally, giving them the sprints to do for an hour, it's enduring an hour of conditioning, just like a run around the block, but it actually is developing power in the process. And that's the key here. We don't want to be developing, say, endurance and then losing another key component for the baseball athlete. 
Olympic lifts is, is the core of our strength and conditioning pr approach. Um, and a lot of people criticize us for that. Why do we use an Olympic lifting approach? Why don't we just use a general strength and conditioning approach? Well, because the components or the benefits of these lifts um, are superior to all their lifts in the weight room when it comes to jumping, running, throwing, which the study here shows that Olympic lifting, because of the dynamic aspects of these lifts and the power aspects of these lifts, they enhance jumping, running, throwing. So this study actually shows it improves throwing velocity. Also shows that th they're the most effective form of lifts enhancing vertical jump height. They remodel uh, hyper and hypertrophy fast twitch muscle fiber. So all the benefits of Olympic lifting are superior to other lifts and many studies show it. We'll look more into that in the next slides. But it's that enhancement of the kinetic chain. It's important to note that evidence shows that Olympic lifting is the only form of lifting that there's no correlation to the size of the muscle and the power or strength of the muscle. It's because the Olympic lifting being a multi-joint movement, it's more of a challenge and a more of an upgrade to the central nervous system than, the, than really the muscular system. There is a muscular system enhancement, but not a hypertrophy, not a big growth of the muscular system. It's an improvement of the coordination of the body's ability to fire the muscles at the right times to get, um, you know, move energy through the kinetic chain, which is really why it's a more athletic way to lift, and therefore that's why it's going to have a better effect on jumping, running, and throwing. If we look at Olympic lifting in comparison to powerlifting, what is powerlifting? That's the bench press, back squat, deadlift. Olympic lifting is the snatch and the clean and jerk. You, you see here where they took a 100 kilo male, which is 220 pounds, and a 75 kilo female. They took them through these lifts with a force plate. And the Olympic lifts, the snatch and the second pull and the jerk, the second pull is when you get above the knee in the, in the clean. This produced from 3,000 to 5,500 watts of power, as opposed to the bench press, back squat, and deadlift produced about 1,100 watts of power at best. So almost five times or five times more power is being pushed out of the Olympic lifts than the power lifts. So on the power side, it's far superior as well. And I talk about how important that is to understand that you only have a s certain amount of time to get create the power in a skill like jumping, running, and throwing. And that's about two tenths of a second. And actually the Olympic lifts, these like the second pull, the moment of peaking power is about within the two tenths of a second. And you're gonna find that when the back sweat and the deadlift, when they're in their point of peaking power, they're in about a 0.6 to one second time frame to do that. And that's happening because of the demands of the technique. What are the demands? The technique in the Olympic lifts are demanding you throw or launch the bar when the power lifts, you're staying under tension the whole time. So that that technical requirement in the Olympic lifts is why it produces so much more power. The, the, the big thing we hear though is, you know, when, when if coaches are gonna argue Olympic lifts, power lifts, they, they come up with the injury um, question. Well, well, what about the injury rates? Well. Actually, if you compare, and it's, it's in one of these studies here, but if you compare the Olympic lifts to the power lifts, the power lifts actually have a considerable amount more energy. Why? Because they're actually, they're segmented lifts, they're not multi-joint lifts, so you actually can do a lot more weight because you're not moving it through the whole body, you're not jumping it up, you're not throwing it up your body, you're just staying under tension, you're hinging, you're, you're, you're pressing, and therefore you can load up a lot more weight because it's more of a closed chain, less dynamic movement. So you're doing about twice the weight. If you look at the world record deadlift, about 1,100 uh, pounds. If you look at the world record clean, somewhere around close to 500 pounds, you're almost, you know, you're more than double the amount of weight you will be doing the, in those power lifts. That's more than likely why it has the higher injury rate. But if we look here at this six year study of Olympic lifting, this is a lead Olympic lifting. There was 3.3 injuries per thousand hours. And if we look at a six year study of major league baseball players, there's 3.6 injuries per thousand hours. So actually it's, it's more dangerous to be a baseball player than it is to be an elite Olympic lifter. And also too, most of those injuries in major league baseball were pitching injuries, upper extremity injuries. So if we took out the pitch position players, the injury rates skyrocketed. So it, it's, it's not that it's more dangerous. It's actually the safest sport. When you looked at all the recreational sports, it was the safest sport. People always ask why it's the safest sport. It's probably because it's highly technical. You, you're, you have a constant emphasis of technique um, to be even be good at it, to, to be efficient enough to, to be able to move a good amount of weight. 
Um, and also, too, it's, it's been around for so long, and there's an Olympic committee that monitors it to where when there was patterns of injury, it was removed. They would disqualify those techniques. And, and the techniques that are certified and, and the only ones you can use are actually been proven to be s extremely safe techniques. So you have, you have an actual uh, group, an organization of people that have tried to make it as safe as possible. We look at uh, contraindicative training. I think that's really the key thing here. You know, everybody has the ability to apply exercises and, and work on strength, power, speed, and all those things. But you know, our, how well is the programming? At the end of the day, programming is the key to all this. You know, if if you don't understand the programming it will take to take, say, an evaluation of your hip mobility and, and improve that, so it, it improves. The, the skill, you know, the, bi the mechanics and the skills, so it, it gives you a better result. If you don't understand how all this works together, you really could be stuck in, in training that is counterproductive or contraindicated. For example, long distance running. Studies show that, uh, you know, it, anaerobic power training is incompatible with aerobic power. So, like, if you add aerobic training to an, to an anaerobic athlete, you're going to hurt his power. Um, and actually, the way around it doesn't work that way. You can add anaerobic power training to an aerobic athlete, and actually their aerobic athlete, their power, their aerobic output gets better. But it, it's incompatible the other way. So if you have an athlete running long distance and then working on power in his strength and conditioning program, you're actually working against yourself, or you're actually negating a lot of the power development. Extreme long toss. I talk about how studies show when you get to these extreme distances, mechanics change, and they change completely different than the mechanics you use throwing 60 feet on the mound. Also, too, it puts a lot more stress on the arm because the mechanics get more rotational, the strides shorten, the, the arm is more pushing the ball, and then the, the torques are excessive on the arm because of those poor mechanics that are being adapted to get to those extreme lengths. So it's contraindicative. If you're working on better mechanics, if you're working on health, all this is working against it. Strength training, short ranges of motion. We're, once again, we're trying to develop mobility, speed, strength, power, motor control, all in the same uh, system. So we've got to be careful in training out flexibility in our lifts or training poor, you know, not training motor control into our lifts because our lifts are, are too segmented and too strength based. Low intensity, high rep strength training. Once again, this would be putting too much aerobic power into our lifts which would then work even in our own lifts worked against our anaerobic power development so it programming is key if we're not programming well we could be completely hurting the athlete or plateauing the athlete and it's cool to use some of this data here that comes from a study that looked from murky ball to major league baseball and the anthropometrics and the athleticism that they have you know we can see from the rookie level to the major league level body mass goes up from 202 to 223. And at the same time, vertical jump goes from 27 inches to 28 or, or plus or minus three. So they're getting bigger, they're jumping higher, they're jumping farther, their broads are going up, their grip strength is going up, their 10 yards are getting faster. Bigger, stronger, faster is really what we're seeing here in this, in this evidence. And at top velocity, we record this as well. And we also use it as in competition. We would like to, we'd rather see our athletes competing in vertical jumps and body size and broad jumps, 10 yard sprints, mobility, than just constantly competing in, in baseball throwing velocity. We'll, they'll be a lot healthier and they'll be a lot, lot more well-rounded and per developed for the sport. Um, we also run our own statistical analysis to see how these metrics are influencing each other and we we do have the peer-reviewed evidence showing that but we like to have our own evidence and you can see here we had a moderate to strong correlation of vertical jump to improving pitching velocity within our own group and so it, it's cool to see ha hey what's happening in our own facility or, or are these things really working um, and I think that's critical too if you're ever going to see the seamless connection of evaluating the metric to training the metric to actually improving the metric and that's what top velocity is known for so if you want to learn more about us if you haven't already go to topvelocity.net here's contact you reach out to us we've got locations all over the country now if you're looking for something in your area um, and uh, here's some of the science on it if you want to go through the science and look these up i recommend you do appreciate you watching the presentation thanks for following see you next time